lot of research on the correlation and the uh, accuracy of different techniques, for instance, with respect to the computerized tomography. We know that for uh, uh, bone changes, MRI is specific but not sensitive enough. But anyway, we know that for diagnostic accuracy, efficacy, MRI, and computerized tomography for the two different scopes stand at top of the mountain. So level two, satisfied. Level three. Level three is where the stuff starts to become more intriguing. Because the diagnostic thinking efficacy is, can be translated as the percentage of cases in which imaging is really helpful to make a diagnosis. What, what does helpful? Uh, uh, it means the change in the distribution, probability distribution of differential diagnosis. If I see a 20-year-old young lady with a click in the joint, the probability that my MRI will lead to a diagnosis that it is different from this displacement with reduction is really limited. But if I uh, have a 55-year-old patient with long-lasting pain, maybe with MRI, I could discover something. So, in terms of diagnostic thinking, the first message to convey to an audience of experts is that What's neontology? So please, don't use imaging to identify the right position of the condyle. I should move the condyle there because I am able to not to move the other. Which is the right position? This one, this one, vice versa. Okay? We can think about that for years. And that's exactly decades <laughs> what's happened in the history of neontology. Okay? How to mount this anatomy? This is real anatomy on dental casts. Centralization, which is the correct position. Of course, it is individually based, physiologically based, whatever you want. But provocatory, why not? abandoning the term centric and simply call it up because it is an utility position for prosthodontic purposes and it's up somewhere in the joint. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but anyway, so if not for neurological purposes, uh, what about the use of MRIs for diagnostic thinking efficacy? It is there that the protagonist enters the arena. So the protagonist, uh, sorry, uh, Portuguese friend, Cristiano, has not been yet, I hope, able to do to my Dutch friend what the real protagonist did some years ago. OK, so that's a soccer uh, joke. But who's the protagonist in our film? The clinician, the clinician. There's no possibility that one single word in the literature or meta-analysis or systematic review completely uh, 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 neglect the role of the clinician. And the clinician should know a lot of stuff from a clinical viewpoint to understand when, why, and if uh, MRIs uh, can be useful for diagnostic thinking so, first, some words on the disposition. We are used to see those fantastic MRIs like we are cutting people like that. But we forgot that each condyle or each joint is sliced six or seven or eight times. There are six or seven or eight slices 
crossing through the condyle and the disc. And you can see different orientation and malposition of the disc because the disc is a tridimensional structure. So uh, every time we try to reason about the disc position in terms of diagnostic thinking efficacy, we should always consider that there are many possible displacements. It is not only a matter of anterior disc displacement, uh, as we are uh, used to think, because there could be uh, an anterolateral displacement when there is also a component of uh, 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 displacement on the lateral side of the joint and not in the medial, or vice versa. There could be a rotational displacement, anterolateral or anteromedial. There could be a pure medial or a pure lateral displacement when the disc is displaced purely medially or laterally to the condyle pole. And this is a graphic taken from that poster, Matteo, uh, thanks for the hard work you are doing. Uh, we retrospectively analyze a lot of MRIs. Uh, we are now up to almost 500, if I remember well. And what we uh, uh, showed, what we depicted, is that even in a population of TMD patients, there is one-fourth of MRIs showing a perfect disposition. All the others are, for one-third of cases, an anterior this displacement, but all the other situations are combined displacements in the tridimension of the joint. So uh, it is really complicated to gain useful information in terms of diagnostic thinking concerning the position of the disc if you consider how much biological variability there is even in a population of patients with TMJ disorder. So, uh, we worked a lot in the past uh, to understand, uh, or at least to give our contribution to understand the correlation with uh, uh, the, the clinical observation and also the old RDC TMD, the correlation uh, uh, of MRI findings with pain, and this is a very brief summary from the literature. We know that if a patient has a TMJ click, MRI will show a disc displacement reduction in slightly more than 80% of the cases. If a patient has TMJ pain, there's an MRI effusion in about 8% of the cases. If there is no effusion, start thinking outside the box. Because sometimes MRIs is even useful to confirm that the diagnosis is not within the joint. Psycho, neuro, uh, all those kind of neuropathic issues we have just discussed, the lene and so on. If there is TMJ cryptus, we got degenerative joint disease, and MRI will show deep displacement with drug reduction in slightly more than 80% of the cases. If there's closed lock, we don't have enough data uh, to understand how many of them could be uh, actually these displacements with reductions as soon as the, the lock is resolved. If there's no sound, we know since the 90s that there could be a displaced disc in about 30% of the joints. And if there is no pain, there's no data. But my message is that we should start thinking about the biological variability and stop thinking as dentists with protocols, dogmas, obligations, a sequence of stats, and so on. Sometimes we got bizarre images, like a hammer shaft in our joint. And no one knows if this is a, a joint 
provoking pain to the patient? I suspect yes, because of this uh, possible diffusion, but who knows? But for sure, thinking about diagnostic thinking efficacy, we must have clear in our mind that when the disc is displaced, the histology, this is a normal histology of uh, a physiological deposition disc, the disc is histologically degenerated. There's a lot of sclerosis, fibrosis. This is a work I'm particularly proud of with Luca Guardo. We are working on the uh, histological analysis of the uh, extracted TMJ disc in patients undergoing TMJ surgery for uh, whatever reason. Okay, but the main concept is that if we uh, keep on thinking about the disposition as a, a, a recommendation for treatment, we are losing information because uh, this displacement is not just a matter of position. And histology says that it is a biological nonsense to try to recapture it because of the morphological and the histological changes that accompany the displacement. 